And that's how we most... We almost didn't get our loan, and I said, over $15, you're kidding me? And they're like, well, it's been sitting there. We didn't remember going it. And that's, yeah. that's the reason to pull, is medical collections generally show up unbeknownst to the consumer. Yeah. Because the, the medical offices, they're, they're churning and burning through people all day long. The last thing they want to be concerned with is... Fifteen dollar trying to collect. Yeah. yeah, it's easier. You know, at the end, generally speaking, what happens at dentist offices and medical offices and all that is if someone hasn't paid something, it goes on their factoring page, their accounts receivable. Thirty days, sixty days, ninety days, and after ninety days, they sell it off to a collection agency at fifteen cents on the dollar, and that collection agency wants to get. They want to make twenty cents on it, which is why if it's a five hundred dollar balance, you can get away with a hundred bucks because. They probably paid, you know, twenty five for it or fifty for it. So, have you noticed that recently? Just recently, I, when they tried to make a, a deal with them for an old credit card debt, yep. those collections agencies are not agreeing. I yep. mean, they're being tough out there now. Yeah, yeah, they really are. Um, I think for a while it was easy to negotiate, yeah. and I think some. Well, I'll tell you what happened. A lot of the collection agencies were actually bought out by a big corporate, uh, several corporations that just set parameters and guidelines yeah. on what they would write off and what they wouldn't. So, so. If you send it, to, if they send it to a collection agency, say a hospital does or something. Send it to a collection agency, <coughs> and you end up paying the hospital instead. What happens? Um, it still is credited to the account. Because they are still in contact with one another about open collections. So then, does the does like, anyone make more money, <laughs> or the collection agency made extra money? The collection agency would make extra money because okay. they would get a percentage of whatever the collection was. Yep. So I mean, I, Curious. should I sh pause the <laughs> the recording? I would tell people who say, oh, "I got this crazy huge medical bill." If it goes to collections, you can probably negotiate it down to thirty percent. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's that was that that's what was happening all over the place. So, uh, I have another quick, full of questions. Um, my daughter-in-law paid off her credit card. It was a big balance. Paid it off on time, and then the next month came, and they said, "Now you owe X amount for interest, whatever." And she was like, "But I paid it in full on the date due." How are they able to charge her more money? They shouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, and she called them, and they said, oh, no, it's something, something, something. And she went, okay, and she made it. Now, some, depending on the card that she has, there are some cards out there that are, sometimes they're the starter cards. Uh, they're the ones that might need a cosigner. They might be secured. Um, they, they calculate interest based on average daily balance instead of the monthly balance. So they may be accruing interest based on whatever the daily rate, the daily balance is, as opposed to at the end of the month, here's what the balance and here's your interest. <coughs> so that may be how it was done, but I would still fight it. Yeah. Yes? Um, Adam, how do you look at uh, <coughs> like a person like Dave Ramsey that, that advocates some pretty radical financial yeah. actions to get out of debt? You thought said you were out of debt. Yep. Um, any thoughts on that? I mean, he... He advocates paying off your mortgage as soon as possible. Do not let it hang out there forever. Yep. And any thoughts, positive, negative? Yeah. How did you do it? Um, well, I used, <laughs> I, I used, I was a Dave Ramseyite to a certain extent. I mean, we used his debt snowball method where we, a lot of people when they're paying down debt wrap or when they're paying down debt period, they will make, let's say there are four accounts and they will make a 15 or 20 or $30 extra payment on every single one of those and think that they're actually doing good, right? They're, they're applying a little bit more to every one of them than the minimum payment. And I liken that to trying to toast a piece of bread with a flashlight, right? <laughs> it's like, this is going to take a long time instead of taking a laser beam or a blowtorch to it, which is how we did it. And so what we did was we said, okay, all of these minimum payments, this one, I'm going to eradicate right now. And what happens is when you take all of that extra money you were sending to these, these extra payments, and you zero in on one, all of a sudden that one goes away and you're like, okay, that feels good. Now let's go to the next one and then go to the next one and go to the next one. And there is something emotional about paying it off and seeing big X marks through the debts that you had that are now being chunked away. So my opinion on that is Dave Ramsey gives very one size fits all advice and not everyone is a one size fits all situation. And so, and, and I also believe in the power of leverage. And so, 
um, you know, the two greatest expenses we have in life are taxes and the interest expense on debt. So if you can get rid of the interest expense on debt, more power to you. To me, that's high interest, credit cards, car loans, student loans, those kinds of things. Your mortgage, if, if you choose to carry a long mortgage at the interest rates today, I wouldn't blame you. You know, at 4%, 5%, we will never, ever, ever see interest rates this low again in our lifetimes. And so I'm okay with carrying a longer 4.5% or 3.75% mortgage and paying on it for 30 years. But with, I believe in buying rental properties because then you've got someone else paying your mortgage for you and you get all sorts of tax deductions on owning rental real estate. Uh, be so aware, get, be aware, there is a big thing to that. If the old tax law, if you make over $100,000, you only get to get rid of half of that deductions that you have. So if you put a $10,000 improvement, you only get to get rid of $5,000 of that if you mm -hmm. make over $100,000. Mm -hmm. All those people wanting rental properties. Yep. <laughs> yep. Because we are, what? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But I do, I also believe um, having been in a position where every single month we were, I, I was writing bills to pay down debt and not feeling like I was getting anywhere, um, I also can appreciate the feeling of not having any and you know, I haven't had a car payment in seven years. Um, we basically write a check for a mortgage and utility and that's it every month. And kid stuff, baseball and gymnastics and all those things. But, um, but it's, it's a good feeling. It's a great feeling to have it paid off. So uh, a friend and I, when I got out of the mortgage business, I still kind of wanted to have a toe in the water. And we have a website called shredmymortgage.com, which is a mortgage acceleration <laughs> software. And it, do, it shows you exactly how to use this, this debt snowball system and it tells you what to pay off and when and how to do it. Um, and we've, you know, we've shown people how to pay off a 30 year fixed mortgage in six years, seven years using the system. So while I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not banging the Dave Ramsey drum every day, I, I recommend his books to everybody. You know, The Total Money Makeover and Financial Peace, I think they're great books for people that want to get on the right track. DMAT is looking into teaching his program. Really? In the finance area. That would be cool. Yeah, good for students, really good for students. I mean, this, I appreciate and wholeheartedly respect all of you for being in here today. The key, I, I believe, is we have to teach the next generation to understand all of this because we've got, uh, and, and, and I'm really passionate about this because I, I go out and I speak on college campuses 90 to 100 days a year, and, and um, the students that I'm speaking to have between forty dollars and $80,000 in student loans. Um, I've talked to some bachelor's degree candidates that have 120000 You know, they have a mortgage coming out and they have nothing to show for it besides a piece of paper from an esteemed university. And um, so, which just makes me esteemed, right? And so, I, um, I think we have to teach uh, young people how to understand all this and that they're making business decisions every day with their money. And so, to be able to, to share this with them is, is really critical. So, please do. Yes? I definitely agree with that. I used to be a banker with Wells Fargo, and I had a, a college kid from Drake who came in, he got a credit card, and he had a question about why he owed something that was on the credit card. He didn't know what interest was. Wow. And this is a Drake student. I mean, the, the kid appeared to be reasonably intelligent. He didn't wow. appear to be a complete dolt. But a lot of parents don't want to share their financial information with their kids. And by not sharing their financial information, they're sharing no financial information. Right. And you have this kid who is a sophomore in college who doesn't realize that if you don't pay off your entire balance, you're going to have to pay some interest. Right. And once I explained it to him, he said, well, that made perfect sense. But he said, nobody explained that that was going to happen. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. I have a, a friend who... His philosophy is checkout time is 18 at noon uh, for his kids. So his, his policy is these kids know exactly what's expected of them at 18, and there is no more financial, you know, what we call economic outpatient support. There is no money coming from mom and dad. I mean, we, I have a program called Unplugging the Parental, uh, Unplugging the Parental ATM Machine, mm -hmm. what to teach your kids so they don't spend your retirement. Because I've been with parents who've said, uh, one dad, in fact, in Western Iowa was saying, my girls are both in community college in California. Um, every Friday they're texting me saying, Dad, we're almost out of money. What do we do? How do we? And I said, so what do you do? 
And he said, well, I sent him a couple hundred bucks. And I said, have you ever heard of Pavlov's dog? You know, that ring a bell and the dog salivate? That's kind of what's going on here. And I said, why do you put money in their account every Friday? And he said, well, I, I just don't want my girls to struggle. And there were a handful of parents around the table. And I said, did you struggle at 20? 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 And they're all going, yeah. Maybe struggling is part of the deal. You know, like that's part of the lesson we have to learn or young people have to learn. So I, I get it. I want to take care of my kids, but at the same time, I want to take care of them in a way that they're financially responsible and knowledgeable. So. Do, do any of you guys know, there was some discussion about putting financial literacy into like requirements for high school. It is. It's they, a, they done that? Yeah, it's part of the model core curriculum, okay. the 21st century skills. The challenge is uh, the geniuses across the street took literally three full days to define what financial literacy was. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's the kind of debate. And I, and I think it's crazy that we have to legislatively mandate that we're teaching money in school mm -hmm. when it's the one thing that will help predict someone's fulfillment or satisfaction or success or ability to thrive in, in life. Um, they are teaching it. Okay. It's being rolled out in the fall. Um, all high schools have mandatory financial literacy requirements, but most uh, districts have no idea what they're gonna teach. I so. used to teach, I mean, when I was in high school, they had finance classes. Yeah, yeah. you know, I used yeah. to, but then when I took it as a sophomore, the teacher told me that unless you're a senior, you shouldn't be in here. Wow. Like, yeah, you won't get an A. There's some very innovative things going on. There's a, a, a bank, financial institution in Western Iowa that put a branch in an elementary school, and the school actually gave up a room about this size. The institution came in and put a teller counter in this room. Fifth graders are the tellers. Second through fifth graders can come in uh, once a week on Thursdays and deposit money in their bank account. And the second grade, uh, second and third graders have a step stool so they can take two <laughs> steps up to be eye to eye with the teller. Um, 258 students over eight months saved over $21,000. Wow. Wow. And what's, what's happening in that is saving is becoming cool in the school mm -hmm. because they're giving them prizes, sweatshirts and caps and pens and all this good stuff. So whenever a kid sees another student with this, these tchotchkes, right, the swag, they're like, oh my gosh, you saved $50 or you saved. So it's becoming this hip thing to do in the elementary school and it's now migrating into the middle school and in the next few years, all those students will be in high school and will be really, really savvy financially. Mm -hmm. So I think it's necessary at the high school, but we gotta start way earlier than that too. So. I think many grow on trees. That's right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, I uh, I greatly appreciate y'all being here. Thanks to Capital View for helping put this on, and uh, to the Iowa Credit Union Foundation, which this is all a lot through a grant that was that was gotten through them. Our goal is to to improve and increase financial literacy efforts across the state. So if this is something that you like and appreciate and want to see more of, let these folks know, and we'll continue offering it. So thank y'all for being here. Yeah, let's give that a big applause.